Professor Michael Sandel, you're one of the world's most prominent ph philosophers, political philosophers, and your work, all the dimensions of your work, contribute to lifting the veil of ignorance on key issues of our world. Can you tell us how your work makes systems, or your different contributions on markets, justice, merit now with the latest book, Make System? Well, there is a thread, you're right, a thread that runs through the books that I've written going way back. And most recently, uh, I've written about the tyranny of merit, the problems with meritocracy, the dark side of meritocracy. And before that, I wrote about the moral limits of markets. And going back to my very first book, in fact, my dissertation, it was about the limits of a version of contemporary liberalism that conceives the self as unencumbered, unattached, prior, given prior to. It's the claims and commitments of a common life, of a civic life. So I've been concerned throughout with the civic project and with the tension between democracy and the civic project on the one hand, and a kind of hyper-individualistic self-understanding on the other. And so the, my critique of meritocracy is that ultimately it leads us to think of ourselves as self-made and self-sufficient. The, the success we enjoy, the successful, believe that their success is their own doing. This is the idea that we are self-sufficient individual agents. And this, too, is the problem with the market fundamentalist faith. So I, I suppose I've been leaning against that way of thinking about civic life, but also about personhood for, uh, throughout, throughout these various projects. Indeed. And, you know, connected to this critique of, of our modern society, in fact, which is what you have been doing and constructing through those different books. My next question is about the contextualization, the contextualization in time and in space. Is there a place for that in your work? What is the role and place of history and geography in your work and your thinking? I th I, I'm not among those who believes that philosophy can be detached from the world, the world that we inhabit, the self-understandings we share the civic troubles of our time. I've, I've always, well, going back to Socrates, Socrates wandered this, he didn't give lectures or even write books, he wandered the streets of Athens and asked, put questions to fellow citizens from all walks of life uh, to bring out their assumptions about the laws of the city and about the meaning of justice. This grounded, situated conception of philosophy um, is one that I think is, is unavoidable and necessary. And so I think that, well, well in, in all, all of the books I've written, I've tried to relate philosophy to the world, to situate it in the actual historical experiences and civic dilemmas of our time. Philosophy, I think, doesn't just prescribe or preach or lay down principles. Philosophy has to be, at the same time as it's normative, it has to be interpretive, to make sense of our condition, to diagnose our circumstance. And the philosophers who, whom I learned the most from, going back to Aristotle and up through Hegel, for example, emphasized the way in which philosophy is interpretive, engages with our condition, tries to make sense of our shared life to, to us as the participants. It doesn't just speak from the clouds and prescribe and, and set, set out principles. So this condition in which we are, which you describe very well throughout this set of contributions and set of books, is situated. Yes. It's contextualized in the current times and, and current space to some degree. The title of my first book, which was my dissertation, was Exporting the American Model. How much of what you're talking about is about the American century? Yeah, about the American century? Yeah. Well, 
my work is surely informed by my situation in American society. Although, as I reflect back, part of what motivated my interest in, the, in these themes was that I found myself doing my graduate studies in the UK. I was at Oxford as a graduate student. And although Britain in many respects is similar uh, with regard to the Anglo-American tradition of philosophy, similar to, uh, to the United States, it provided a certain distance that gave me a critical perspective on assumptions that underlie American social and political life. And I found that critical perspective uh, revealing. And in particular, it, it enabled me to identify certain self-understandings to do with the unencumbered self against which I argued for a situated conception of human agency that I might not have been as alive to had I not spent four years looking at America from a distance. So my, my project is not to export the uh, American ideas um, or models to the world. That's not my project. That would be a kind of triumphalist project, as, as I it's understand definitely not. <laughs> it. It's really yeah. to think critically about the way in which uh, certain ideas and certain ways of conceiving community and politics and democracy that find pronounced expression in the United States can reveal tendencies in, uh, and challenges that democracies face in other parts of the world. So there is a, it's a, I suppose you could say it's a dialogic uh, understanding of one's own situation and the democratic project more generally. There's definitely no triumphalism at all in your work, that's for sure. But you know, the point is that this model, which you really outline through this work, as indeed, you know, spread through the world throughout the 20th century, uh, and indeed has become a model in which many of us live today, we, and th therefore corresponds to our own situations in many different parts of the world. In fact, you're, you're putting it this way, yeah. um, reminds me how I've been struck that when I traveled, when the books have been translated and I traveled to other countries and other societies, um, not only in Europe, but in East Asia, for example, how the assumptions about markets, for example, the market triumphalist, okay, certain individualistic notions, have traveled. And when, when I was uh, giving talks abroad following the publication of What Money Can't Buy, when I was in China, for example, and I would put hypothetical examples to the audience, largely young audiences, their pro-market convictions were as powerful as the ones I find uh, in American audiences in China. Um, now, this was not in the last few years. This was during the period after the market opening in China. Um, and similar experiences in South Korea, in Poland, for example, some of the Eastern European countries that embraced the uh, American uh, market faith in a kind of radical way after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, I was struck. They've embraced these assumptions, which we would have associated with American views of markets and the public good being conceived in individualistic terms. And here I'm finding these assumptions among young people in Warsaw and in Shanghai and in Seoul. And that struck me 
So in a way, the diagnosis that I've made, the critical diagnosis of the American market faith or hyper-individualism, I encounter as I travel because those ideas and those models have traveled. And I want to call them into question where, where they've traveled as well as where, they're, where they, they may originate. Yeah, but that's very clear. This is why I pushed you a bit on this notion of contextualization, because it's very clear for, for me that even though you don't necessarily mention this historical and, and geographical contextualization, this is exactly what is in, in your work. And my next question, because it's also very clear that this is a critical lens that you're offering to us of our own situated uh, context, what, what is, you know, how do we move from this critical lens, which is extremely necessary, how do we move there to what I like to call constructive engagement with new solutions? How do we displace, replace markets and the market faith? How do we go beyond merit? Uh, what do we do? What's the next step? Well, the next step is to try to prompt or provoke or inspire hard thinking and public deliberation about alternatives, which means deliberation about competing conceptions of justice and of the common good. And at a time when the media, and social media in particular, make these kinds of deliberations and dialogues very difficult because the media landscape is really designed to capture people's attention by feeding them what they already believe. It's antithetical to reasoned public deliberation about big questions that matter across our differences. So the first step, it's a very difficult one, is to create venues and platforms for public debate about big questions that matter, including questions of values across our differences, including across cultures, but within societies as well. We desperately need this. That's a project that I find fascinating uh, and have done some experiments to, uh, with, with such platforms, some experiments with the, the BBC platform where we uh, found a way technologically to link participants uh, remotely from 60 different countries at once to have some of these uh, debates about climate change, about free speech versus hate speech, about, about meritocracy, about inequality. But we need these debates also within societies. And that means uh, inventing and nourishing venues and public places and common spaces where these discussions can happen. And should those discussions take place within particular societies or nations, or should they also have an, a transnational, international dimension? We're here yeah. at the heart of International Geneva yeah. with an architecture of international organization. And, you know, a bit the, the, the point of this question is what role and what place is there for this architecture? Or is it dead? Do we need to completely reinvent that? Or can we save it through this type of mechanisms that you're suggesting? I think we need to reinvent the mechanisms and the platforms and the venues. And to, to go to the first part of your question, we need to have these discussions within our societies because we've lost the art of democratic public discourse even within democratic societies around the world. This is one of the reasons that citizens everywhere are so deeply frustrated with politics and politicians in the terms of public debate, the hollowed out terms of public debate and technocratic understandings of, of politics uh, as, a, as a, the handmaiden of economics have crowded out public debate. And, and we, we've also lost the ability to listen, which is an important civic art, the art of listening. So we need to do this within our societies and at the same time across cultures, globally and internationally. And the one can enrich the other because we can become better at reasoning across national borders 
if we develop the art of public discourse within societies. And our own domestic political debates can be informed and enriched if we encounter the debates and struggles of societies with assumptions different from our own. So uh, it's important, I think, to do both. But it will require inventing and imagining and enacting venues and platforms for public discourse, including global public discourse, that, ha that we don't currently have. And if I may add one, one difficulty, one extra difficulty in that, uh, on that level is language. What is our common language? For now, it's English. Yeah. And how much is that actually shaping the way in which we engage in those discussions and the types of discussions we can have and the people who are around it? The yes. It's, uh, it's a difficult question because the, um, that English has become, in effect, a kind of global language, at least among those in academic life or those who've been through universities, uh, it's, it's a strength and a weakness. The worry is the one that you just articulated. Does that leave out certain modes of understanding or of expression that are important? The, the strength or the possibility is that it does provide, and I'm thinking of some of the experiments that I've been engaged in, it does provide the possibility for public discussion and debate across cultures that would be very difficult if we had to depend on uh, translating every one of those. And here I'm thinking of a series of experiments I've done, a series of programs for NHK, Japan's National Broadcasting, Television Broadcasting, where we brought together in a, in a studio over a period of time young people university age or just at 20s and 30s. Young people from Japan, the United States, China, um, and occasionally other countries to discuss questions of justice, equality and inequality, the claims of community, the role of markets, the meaning of success, and that there is a common language, even though that may uh, exclude some modes of expression, enables some of those discussions to be quite illuminating and enriching, and it would be difficult to have them uh, without that. We, we did one where we brought together students from Japan, China, and South Korea to discuss historical memory, and in particular the memory of the Second World War, and how it continues to bear and weigh on the current relationships among those three countries. This is very sensitive, delicate terrain, politically and morally. And we sat for maybe three hours with young people from each of those countries, talking together, probably for the first time ever, certainly on television, about these very sensitive topics. Now, if we didn't have English as a, as a common language, paradoxically, English was the medium, the linguistic medium, for this otherwise very, very difficult conversation. So it's a strength and it's a weakness. It depoliticized it a bit, or it neutralized it, it a bit. It created enough space, and the fact that I was an outsider, I suppose, also helped um, that that they could discuss these very fraught questions about what they were taught in school, about one another, and about the history of the Second World War, and about current relationships, and, and about whether they should think of themselves as being responsible for the sins and injustices of their grandparents and great-grandparents, or is responsibility a purely individual matter? I mean, the, these are some of the most volatile questions uh, that, that we face to do with historical memory, for example, and, and moral responsibility. So 
so it's a strength and a weakness that English functions in this way. I would like to go back to what money can buy, which yeah. is one of my absolute preferred books of yours. Thank you. And uh, what I want to, to uh, ask you about is that you focus in that book on the moral limits of markets. Today, we are faced with amazing global challenges, very complex global challenges. And, you know, some of the discussions around those global challenges is bringing actually market solution. If we think about market for CO2, etc., there's market solutions are still very strong. On the other hand, the last 10 years, I would say, have shown that there are not only moral limits to market, but also, in fact, efficiency limits of uh, markets. And so my question is here, when we think about the common good, the global challenges of today, can't we actually also, you know, take a step further and argue that there are strong uh, efficiency limits to market solutions? Yes, and we see this, to take the example of climate change, we see this in debates about the role of market mechanisms to reduce global carbon emissions. Uh, the, the global agreements, such as they are, included provisions for, uh, for tradable mar markets in, in pollution, really, buying and selling the right to pollute or to emit. And this was defended on efficiency, standard efficiency grounds. And in What Money Can't Buy, I was critical of reliance on that, uh, uh, on enabling rich countries, in effect, to buy their way out of reducing their own emissions by paying some other countries to reduce emissions uh, that would be politically difficult domestically. And many economists attacked me for that. They said, but, but this is the most efficient solution. But today, to, to go to your point about whether, so I was raising a, a moral objection that it erodes the sense of shared sacrifice and global solidarity, mutual responsibility, that any serious attempt to transform our relation to nature requires. But you're right. We've now seen that the, that the promised efficiency arguments for these market mechanisms are in doubt. And using the price system in general, whether through tradable emissions permits or even through carbon taxes, which I'm in favor of, I think carbon taxes are not subject to some of the objections I raised against tradable emissions credits. But they haven't worked just on a practical basis. They haven't enabled us to come to grips with climate change. And now there's a growing awareness of the need for substantial direct public investment in green energy. The, the Green New Deal is not simply using the price system to try to manipulate people's behavior or create a s structure of incentives. It's about, uh, about mounting political support, gathering political support for the kinds of major public investments in the measures that would be required to develop a green uh, economy. And so I think you're right, though I was focused on the, on the corrosive effect on solidarity and mutual responsibility, the moral aspect. You're right that even on efficiency grounds, um, manipulating market mechanisms alone is not a sufficient way of contending with the, the climate crisis. Can I finish with the last question, which is what will be the next theme of your next book? Can you share that with us or is that a secret? It's not a secret, <laughs> but I haven't, I don't have it fully worked out yet. Okay. Um, so um, here's one theme that intrigues me that I would like to explore more, which is we seem traditionally, we've assumed that social and political arrangements are the subject of human agency. We've given up on the idea that kings rule by divine right or are installed by nature. And we regard 
political, the allocation of political power to be a human choice, a matter of a social contract or public deliberation or human agency, whereas we consider that science, the natural world, is given. But increasingly, this seems to be, the reverse seems to be the case. As science and technology have advanced with genetic engineering, for example, we have growing faith that the natural world is not given. The new genetic technologies can transform us uh, and nature. So nature is malleable. But at the same time, partly because of the economistic way of thinking about political life, we've come to assume that social and political life is governed by the laws of economics or the laws of the market that really make it quite remote from human agency and democratic deliberation and choice. The, the era of globalization, neoliberal globalization, was essentially presented in this way. This is the way things are now. This is what we were told by the neoliberal globalizers in the 80s and 90s. And unless we allow capital to flow across borders, unless we uh, enact these free trade agreements, unless we outsource jobs to low-wage countries, unless we obey the laws of economics, um, we won't have prosperity, we won't have a good society. So why is it? This is the question I'd like to explore. Fascinating paradox. That now we can transform nature. That's an arena for human agency, but we've given up on exercising human agency to transform our social and political lives. That's the theme I'd like That's to explore. That's a wonderful now. theme, and you'll have to come back and talk to <laughs> us about the next book. It's wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Sandel. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much for having me. <laughs>